We've talked now a lot about plots and rebellions and things that tried to remove Elizabeth from the throne. And you probably noticed that all of them failed. None of them actually removed her from power or changed her power at all. She was able to remove and stop these rebellions. You need to know exactly why and how. It's not just one reason, it's actually five. I'll go through each of them quickly and I think this video will be really quick because it's just a tiny piece of information. See, firstly, as we've heard with the Rodolfi plot and even a little bit with Essex's rebellion, spies have played a very major element of, should we say, detecting rebellions in the first place, but also stopping them. There's a later rebellion you're going to talk about when we look in the third section, Troubles at Home, um, but with the Babington plot already as well, there is a massive element of spying, code breaking, and which we say responsibility. This is led by a man called Francis Walshingham. If you ever want a specific name to name the spy master, but this is very effective at detecting rebellion and stopping it before it even happens, like with the Rodolfi plot. As well as that, there was a religious settlement. Again, I'm gonna go over this in a different video, but this religious settlement was quite effective. The religious settlement to ease the tensions between the Protestants and the Catholics in England so that most Catholics actually were quite, should we say, friendly to Elizabeth. They liked her because she was compromising with them rather than fighting against them, which is what they'd seen before. Some Catholics go off and rebel, but many more would have rebelled had this religious settlement not taken place. So in doing that, it's reduced the effectiveness of rebellion. There are less people willing to fight against her. On top of that, Elizabeth was a very skilled politician. That's, what I mean by that is that she is very good at maintaining relationships with, let's say, Parliament and the Privy Council. She is able to talk to people and get them on her side. For example, um, that Robert Cecil, member of the Privy, Privy Council, is a really good example of how the Privy Council are aware of her power and don't overstep their boundaries, which means they are less likely to go against her and more likely to want to be on her side. On top of that, there were very visible public punishments for people who were rebelling. We've heard about how Essex lost his sweet mine monopoly. We've talked about how, um, should we say, the Norfolk was put under house arrest. We've got the Rodolfi plots, the plotters being executed. People knew what would happen if you rebelled against Elizabeth. And so if you know what's happening, then even frankly, we know that those people are going to not go for rebellion. They're going to prefer their lifestyle than go against Elizabeth's rule. And frankly, Elizabeth wasn't doing a bad job as a ruler, arguably. To different people, they would say different things, but the alternatives to Elizabeth would be a foreign king that might be completely different to Elizabeth's way of life, or Mary Queen of Scots, which frankly was not the majority population in England. These unconvincing alternatives meant that Elizabeth, arguably, for a lot of people, was the best choice for the job, which meant they were, again, less likely to rebel. If you can remember what these are, if you can explain what these are, and you can say why they stopped rebellion, or at least reduce the effectiveness of it, then you will be able to revise this section. Thanks for listening, guys. I'll see you later.